Hello and welcome to Analysis. I'm Jonathan Steele. Three years ago today, Tunisian fruit vendor Mohamed Bouazizi set himself on fire in protest at tough living and working conditions. His dramatic act sparked protests across the country and the whole wider region of the Middle East. The protests in Tunisia itself eventually forced President Zina El Abedin Ben Ali in January 2011 to flee the country. And this sparked upheavals across the Middle East, which became known as the Arab Spring. The Islamist party leader Ennahda became the first democratically elected party in Tunisia to come to power in 2011. But his administration has faced constant upheaval, as demonstrators and political activists have taken to the streets, often resulting in violent clashes with state forces. The leader of the Ennahda party, Rashid Ghanoushi, has now agreed with the main opposition leader to create a caretaker technocratic coalition government under a new prime minister. But let's first take a closer look at how it all began in December 2011. It was grueling poverty that on December the 17th, 2010, led 26-year-old Mohamed Bouazizi to douse himself in paint thinner and set himself on fire as a protest against his situation. That morning, police had confiscated his handcart because he lacked a permit to sell fruit and then beat him when he resisted. He was then abused and rejected by the local council when he tried to complain. On the streets of Sidi Bouzid, a picture of Bouazizi had been affixed to the monument outside the town's municipal offices. The date of his self-immolation is painted on walls with the graffiti, announcing the town as a place of freedom. Despite government efforts to placate the unrest that began on the day of Bouazizi's death, more protests started. Following more protester deaths by both self-immolation and police brutality, the rallies and protests grew and started to spread, eventually reaching the capital, Tunis. Lawyers and trade unionists started to demonstrate, and Ben Ali sacked some of his government ministers. Demonstrators were rounded up and arrested, and reports of torture were widespread. 2011 started with demonstrations as police brutality and the use of water cannons, tear gas and live ammunition failed to quash the protests. By January the 13th, 66 people were reported to have been killed and countless others wounded. Ben Ali then made a televised address announcing unprecedented concessions and vowing not to seek re-election in 2014. When this failed to stop the protests, he banned gatherings of more than three people and threatened to use arms against the demonstrators. Ben Ali's Tunisia was a police state with the president relying on hand-picked security and intelligence forces to maintain his rule. When Ben Ali ordered the Tunisian army's chief of staff, Rashid Amar, to fire on the protesters, the general refused. The military instead turned its guns on the security and intelligence forces and gangs of hooligans that Ben Ali had sent into the streets to sow panic. On January the 14th, the army led by Rashid Amar seized control of the airports and arrested members of Ben Ali's family. The president, however, managed to escape. He reportedly flew first towards Malta, then Paris, before finally turning towards the Gulf, where he landed and was given sanctuary in Saudi Arabia. As Jonathan still wrote in The Guardian recently, Western leaders like to think that they are bringing democracy to less enlightened parts of the world. In Tunisia, things look different. They see a West that supported a string of Arab dictators. In Tunisia, the forces of freedom and democracy are grouping themselves. The fight for independence, human rights and dignity has begun. Well, that was a documentary of the events of December 2010 and January 2011. 
With me in the studio to discuss where Tunisia is now, three years on from those catalyzing events, is Oliver McTurnan from the group Forward Thinking, which has done extensive mediation in Tunisia with various political parties. On Skype, we have Dr. Nour el Miladi, a Tunisian academic now at Qatar University, and on the phone, Merezia Labidi, who is the deputy speaker of the Tunisian Legislative Assembly. She's sometimes been dubbed the highest ranking female political figure in the whole Arab world. Welcome to you all. Well, let me start with you, uh, Dr. Nouradil Miladi. What uh, do you think was the real reason why this coalition government had to be set up? What, what prompted it? Can you, can you hear? Recent uh, appointment of the, um, the new uh, prime minister. I would argue that obviously because political life in Tunisia has come to a deadlock after three years of the, of the revolution. Um, the, 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 the actual fact of the situation was the um, coalition government that was formed after the elections of the uh, 23rd of October 2011 um, uh, d d d didn't manage in actual fact to uh, make any um, um, changes to the uh, economy, to political life, to reforms that were people were looking for, partly because um, of the opposition that wasn't in favor of this government, of the opposition that is obviously putting all kinds of obstacles in front of, the, of, of this government that is, that is formed by the, what is called the Troika, including another party. But also partly because um, the, 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 the Troika government itself, in my personal opinion, has not managed to capitalize on the expertise of the Tunisians who are inside the country and also outside the country. The, 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 the interim or this government, uh, which is led by the Troika, uh, it, it really excluded lots, lots of the experts in the economy, in the media reform, uh, in all kinds of walks of life, and really used only or mainly at least its people, meaning people who are affiliated with these political parties. Uh, so, in a way, what we are faced with is, is, is really a, a government that is, that is co coming to a deadlock in terms of changing the status quo, reforming the country, taking the transition to democracy to a, a step forward. Unfortunately, in my opinion, this government has really failed miserably in doing that. Um, well, it has succeeded so far in, in one thing, which is to maintain peace in the country, to try to not lead the country towards a situation where we are witnessing now, for instance, Egypt that is um, going through, or also to um, the, 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 the way that is Libya really going through. Um, that is probably, if I, am, if I am optimistic, I would say this is what has the government has succeeded in doing. Also, the government has succeeded in, in, in probably maneuvering uh, uh, in terms of proposing a person who is uh, probably, hopefully, he'll be leading the country to the elections for all the next elections. All right, but let, but let, also, um, uh, he'll be serving partly the 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 service of the of the of the Tunisians um, 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 uh, in, in in the near future. Well, let me let's turn to Merezia Labidi. I mean, uh, that was a strong indictment of the government up till now of their performance, saying they failed to deal with the economy and unemployment and so on, and they shut out experts. I mean, what do you say to that? Well, it's easy uh, for those who observe, uh, those who are acting, to say that uh, they failed or they have excluded experts. I think this government, first of all, is... Uh, a coalition, a coalition of three parties, and uh, I think the third of these governments are experts, are independent from uh, uh, political parties. But uh, after a revolution, the country is facing a huge problem of uh, economic growth, disparity and inequality between regions, and also the great number of unemployed youth those especially with diploma. I think any government, whatever is the expertise of its members, would have faced the same troubles, the same problems in Tunisia. And let's not forget that we have uh, reached uh, uh, really a really tremendous number of uh, cities and of strikes, 33, uh, I think 36,000, yes strikes and uh, uh, sit-ins, what 
kind of government can succeed fully in economic, in dealing with uh, uh, economic problems and in providing jobs for uh, everyone if it is faced with such uh, social protest, organized social protest. Well, are you I confident? That are you the confident? The challenge is big. I, I, are you I'm, sorry I'm to interrupt you. I just want to ask, uh, are you confident? said that, yes, indeed, in spite of the difficulties, the government has managed uh, in, let's say, positive way, the issue of security and, and security and facing terrorism. And I think that we have succeeded in mitigating and in uh, the, 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 the uh, aftermath of terrorist acts and especially in saving Tunisian society from being penetrated by violence. And this is, I think, a tremendous success especially in after uh, post-revolution. Uh, well, are you, are you confident that the new government, uh, with the new prime minister, will be able to settle in without having protests against it as well? Well, indeed, this government was trying to find his way out of the economic trouble. And what Plex was really due to the uh, political crisis, our Let's, let's say that our capital in Tunisia is the confidence, the trust, the trust between Tunisia and the trust between Tunisia and the international community. I think with the choice of Mr. Mehdi Jama, who is an expert in his domain, in his, uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, who, know, who uh, has the trust of the international community and of a majority of political parties. So with the trust, we can realize and we can achieve success we were not able to do with a political crisis. But there is a condition, is that political parties shall put aside their own interests and focus on, Tun on Tunisia interest. And well, I'm, I'm quite confident. Well, Oliver, turn, turn. I mean, of course, we pointed out that it was a coalition government before, and now it's still a coalition government, which is pretty unusual. It's not the case in Egypt, not the case in Syria, not the case in the Gulf. I mean, what is it about Tunisia that, is, that has kept it more, you know, less violent and, and more conciliatory in terms of its political elite? I think it has been the quality of the political leadership that Enada, long before they were elected, had made the decision that the only way an interim government could work was a coalition between the left, the Islamists, and the trade unions. And they tried to put that together. Now, obviously, you're going to meet obstacles as you try to do that, because it's against vested interests of other people. So you were always confronted with the spoilers, and that's natural in time of transition. I think there's another added problem, I'd say, is when you move from dictatorship to an effort to be democratic, you still have the institutions that are not fit for purpose. And they're not fit for purpose simply because they're being used by the old regime for its interests and purposes. And to turn all that around in a relatively short period of time is almost an impossible task. And to do it then in coalition, where you have to build trust between your partners to make it work, again, it's, it's a very, very tall order to give to people. Well, um Merazir Labidi, I mean, the new prime minister is actually an old prime minister. And indeed, at one point, he was part of the Ben Ali machine, if you like, in the party. Do you really think um, th this is a step forward and not some kind of return to the, the pre-Arab Spring system? No, he never served under Ben Ali regime. Indeed, he is the actual Minister of Industry under this government, the current government. And he was never a minister in the, in the 90s? No, no. Never at any time? No, no. Indeed, he's very... Uh, he's an outsider in politics. Uh, he's uh, very new in politics. No, no. He never served under Ben Ali regime. So this is really not going back to the past in any way at all? This is no, still part I, of the post-revolutionary? Because it's uh, future. He's young. Uh, and uh, he is an expert, and I think he has also, uh, he has proved being a very good minister of industry in uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, uh, tackling one of the main problems after the, the post-revolution uh, is the problem of uh, exploitation and uh, uh, of uh, phosphat, uh, the phosphate. Mm. So uh, in Gafsa, in the, in the uh, mine regions of Gafsa, so I think that uh, he's a very competent man. Yes, I think I'm sorry, I, I got a little bit confused. I think mm -hmm. the, what I was trying to say, what, what I misunderstood was that the main, main opposition leader who worked out with Mr. Ganushi that there should be this prime minister, he, the opposition leader, is an old Ben Ali person and an old minister from the Ben Ali time, isn't yeah, that yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. That, that, that was my mistake. I'm so sorry. But, but the fact that the opposition leader from the Ben Ali time is so influential that he can help to choose the new prime minister, is, isn't, that a, isn't that a bad thing in a way? Um, I don't think so. You know, this uh, national dialogue or national debate was done under the patronage of four organizations and many, many uh, uh, pa political parties. Of course, the party of Nida uh, is one of them, but uh, uh, he is not the main actor. Indeed, in Tunisia now, Nahda, my party, proved to be one of the main actors, and UGTT, the organizations of the trade union, proved being the main player. And I think what is positive is that these two main players now are getting closer to each other and acting for the benefit of, all, of Tunisia and all Tunisians. And I think this is a good news. Now well, OK, we, 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 I, we have to end. I'm sorry, we have to... We, I'm sorry to cut you off. We will come back to all this in the second half. We need to take a short break here and then we will come back to, to, to the points you're making. Thank you very much and uh, stay with us till the break. Thank you.